Good afternoon. Uh, I have the um, complicated assignment of following after Dr. Ajibade. Uh, so my my knees have been shaking since morning. Hallelujah. So let me attempt to follow him by also praying. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you and we ask that you bless us. We ask that you open our eyes and in the end be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Right, so um, let me say as a contribution to what um, Brother Ol Olua Shugo started saying, there was a time I preached in the chapel and um, I used a narrative text and many of my students came to me and said, aha, you used to teach us expository preaching, text driven preaching. You didn't do it. And I said, okay, so what are the lessons that you learned today? He said, you said this, you said this, and you said that. I said, okay, those three things, are they from the text? He said, yes. I said, okay. But because I didn't follow these um, three points, something, <laughs> I just told the story and then I brought out the lessons. So there are very many ways to do exposition. Um, though um, I'm, lit, I'm still arguing in my mind a little with um, um, Olua Shogo's um, um, postulation, but maybe I would ask um, Dr. Ajibadi later and then maybe he will clarify for me. But since he was my teacher, the things he taught me uh, are contrary to what I heard a little, but scholarship is growing. Amen. So in the morning, we heard that um, we heard the, the meaning of narrative preaching. And my assignment is just to tell us what are the features of narrative preaching. Um, and I started by saying that the Bible is full of stories, over 800 stories in the Bible. And if God will um, choose for his word to be so full of stories, I think that preachers of our generation and in any generation should take cognizance of the fact that God likes to speak um, using, using this kind of, of, of style. So let's go to the next, um, of, next slide now. These, these theologians said stories are the most universal form of human communication. The human brain is hardwired to take information through stories. Most of us may forget sermons that we hear um, or sermons that we have heard maybe 20 years ago. But many of us will not forget the drama that we watched. Am I correct? In fact, some of us can still remember some dramas we watched in primary school. Stories are that strong. And every culture um, has a form of story or the other. Let me not belabor us with, with many of the other things that Dr. Ajibade had already said. Let's just go to the next slide um, and just go straight to next slide. We just go straight to the, the, the six components or features of a biblical narrative. The first is that a biblical narrative has a narrator. So we, that's why we call it narrative. Then we have a character. Then we have the setting. Then we have the plot. Then we have the design pattern. Then we have the rhetorical device. Six things make up a generally a biblical narrative and we'll just take those things one by one the first is a narrator now genesis 1 1 somebody should quote it for me if you cannot quote genesis 1 1 we're going to send you <laughs> we're going to send you somewhere this morning right so anybody or should i point somebody you like god has something to say to you anybody genesis 1 1 I know we're hiding under the chorus thing. 
I want to be sure that we know it. One person, anybody, I will call Nemo. Oh yeah, Mama, Mrs. Reverend, Mrs. Charity. In the, I want to, to say it slowly. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Does that look like somebody is telling us a story? Does that sound like that? Okay. It's like saying, story, story. Gatana, gatana, cool. <laughs> if I spoke in tongues, then... Uh... Hello. And, and I can just say that and begin to, to quote the Bible. I can just say story, story, story in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. It sounds like somebody is telling us that story. That is the voice of the biblical narrator. Now, there have been arguments, and, I, and I, I really don't want to go into that. There have been so many arguments as to, is it the voice of the author or the voice of the narrator? Now, first of all, I, I will just quickly say that generally, we believe that God is the author of the Bible. Is that correct? Am I, am I, am I in orthodox tradition? That, that God is the author of the Bible. That's why we call it God's word, Abby. The way you're not answering me, I'm beginning to be afraid of. Yeah. Dr. Nicodemus, answer me too, so that I can be sure that uh, Stellenbosch is with me. Oh. <laughs> right, so, so the voice of the narrator is always, most of the time, in biblical narratives. The one that he, um, he used this morning, um, um, in Nehemiah chapter 8, we find that it's as though somebody was trying to give us the history, right? And, and, and thank you again for that message. Somebody was trying to give us the history of what happened. The people came, they gathered, they called on, on Ezra, they asked him to preach to them and all of that. Somebody is telling that story. And every narrative, even normally, you would have to tell the story. Okay, so um, tell me something about your primary school. I know I have 30 minutes, but I'm okay. Just tell me something about your primary school, um, Dr. David. I attended primary school in Taraba State. My parents were missionaries, and, um, and my best friend was someone that I've come to. I mean, I, I just reconnected with him some months ago, so many years back. So He told us his story, but he narrated the story, right? So we have biblical narrators. And one of the things I want to say about the biblical narrator is that you must consider the biblical narrator authoritative. Whatever the biblical narrator says must be considered truth, must be considered fact. Now, you must also distinguish between the voice of the narrator and the voice of other characters in the, in, in the narrative. Because sometimes there are contradictions. For instance, the, the text I have, I have, um, I have picked, 1 Samuel chapter, thir chapter 31, verse 1 to 5. Somebody should read for us. I'd like you to go very fast. I have just 30 minutes. First Samuel 31, 1 to 5. Let me do like we do in, uh, in church. Another person. Another person, 2 Samuel 1, verse 6. Put your finger there. When this person finishes reading, then you will read. All right, go ahead. The Philist. Yep. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
All right, so in this story, the narrator tells us that Saul died, right? And how did he die? He killed himself. And when his armor bearer saw that, his armor bearer also killed himself. Now, somebody now go to chapter 1 of Second Samuel and um, verse 6. I happen to be on my Giba, yes. And said, mm -hmm. and there was Saul leaning on his spear with the chariots and riders almost upon him. Mm. Continue, sir. When he turned around and saw me, he called out to me, and I said, What can I do? He asked me, Who are you? An Amalekite answered. Then he said to me, Stand over me and kill me. I am in the truck death, but I'm, I'm still alive. So I stood over him and killed him because I knew that after he had fought him, he could not survive. Right. And I took the crown that was on his head, that was on his head, and the band in his arm, and I brought them here to my Lord. All right. So we find a disparity. Saul kills himself, and then the other guy say, I'm the one that killed him. There are biblical authors who have tried to harmonize this text and say that, well, Saul, you know, tried to kill himself, but he didn't die. And then the young man came and saw him, and then the young man killed him. And um, there are those who have said, no, the young man only told a lie just to get the favor of David. He felt that, he thought that David would see Saul as an enemy, and him killing the enemy of Saul, I mean, killing the enemy of David will give David joy. And David will say, wow, yes, I'm going to promote you um, in my kingdom. But, well, I don't want to tell you the side I belong to <laughs> in this matter. But what I can say is this. I believe the narrator. I believe the voice of the narrator as opposed to the voice of the character. And so we must distinguish every time in, in a story where is the narrator speaking and where is the character speaking? Because again, one of the things I'm, we're still going to talk about is the fact that some biblical characters, the way that biblical stories are written, many things are left for us to guess. The, the biblical writer, they did it in such a, so, so intelligently that they don't tell you everything. Narratives in scripture would rather show you than tell you. So they, they would write the story in such a way that you would have to, to put the bits and pieces together sometimes yourself. And so every time there's a controversy, who should we believe? Ah, they are not saying anything. Again. So we believe the biblical narrator. As opposed to a character speaking, the biblical narrator's voice is more authoritative um, in, in explaining the scripture than the voice of any biblical character. And why is that? Because biblical characters can also be dubious. They can have two different versions. A good, a good person will suddenly become a bad person. Remember, David is the man after God's heart. Then David becomes a murderer. Collects somebody's wife, kills the person. And so I always tell people that you're not supposed to be like David, actually. We're not supposed to be like biblical characters because biblical characters are flawed. They are like us. We are flawed as well. We have good times. We have bad times. They also have good times. They have bad times. We can only emulate them, copy certain things, certain good things about them. But I'm not supposed to be like David. If I'm going to be like David, then I will eye somebody's wife here. Yes, because I'm like David, but I'm not supposed to be like David. But I'm supposed to learn certain things from David. All right, so there are, apart from narrators in biblical narratives, there are the characters. The characters are the major ingredients in, in any good story. Um, le let me go a little bit out of the Bible. Um, let me go a little bit into, how many of us used to watch James Bond? 007. Okay. Yeah, so, um, okay. So, 
James Bond is a character, right? And he's like the major character in all of his Bond movies. And in, just like that, in the Bible, there are characters. And the characters are to depict um, human beings. And the reason why I, I used human beings and I did not say human beings and divine, it's because God has a constant presence in scripture. Kind of like the unspoken presence always in almost every always in all stories in esther for instance dr ajibade mentioned that the whole story was was about god's move for israel but god was never mentioned so the characters depict individuals people it represents the people in the plot and the major characters, the plot spins around the major characters. For instance, the story of David and Goliath. The main character in that story was who? Was David, not Goliath. But the entire story, that's why in, this, in the same story, we left, we left where Goliath was threatening Israel and we went to where his father sent him. You remember? The setting changed from the war front, and we went to the house where the father was sending him to his brothers on the field because he's the main character. And so the entire plot is shaped around David. Anywhere David goes, the plot follows. Anywhere, everywhere David went, the plot followed because David was the center, um, the main character in the story. And characters are depicted in many ways. And there are many ways that characterization in the Bible is done. Um, but I will use the characterization um, paradigm of, um, of Jeffrey. So just help me move to um, the next the next one. Just I have 30 minutes. Just the next how oh, good. So Jeffrey Otters gives us seven ways in which the Bible writers characterize, use, do characterization of their characters. The first is the dialogue. The way the characters speak help us to explain the kind of persons that they are, right? What they say, if you follow what the characters say, you are able to guess whether this person is a good person or this person is a bad person. So their dialogue helps us to know or to depict their characters. The second is their action. And I mean, <laughs> narratives are full of the actions of characters, what they did particularly, you know. And tomorrow, tomorrow is, we're gonna talk more about that tomorrow. Then the Bible will also give us titles and names. The Bible will also do a description. Now, I have to stop here on the issue of physical description because the Bible many times does not do much about physical descriptions. But when it does, it has something to do with what will happen to that character later. One of the good examples is um, Absalom, the son of, of David. He talks about his hair, right? It, it, he doesn't talk about anybody or that person's hair. He just talks about Absalom's hair. And you'll be wondering, what has his hair got to do with us? It's because his hair is going to get him killed later. Do you, do you, do you understand that? So he tells us about his hair because his hair is going to matter later in the story. Later in the story, he's running away. And then suddenly his hair catches the bush or catches the tree. And then because of that hair, he can't run again. And so when, when the Bible, biblical authors don't really talk much about the, the physical character of a, of, a character, of, of a personality in scripture. But when they do, it's very important. It's very important that you take note of, of physical descriptions because usually they, 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 don't, they don't spend time on that. But when they do, please take note. And you can find that in many other, other characters that are mentioned, the, the size of Goliath was mentioned. You remember, 
just to tell us how terrifying he was and how small David is. For us to know how great the fall of Goliath was going to be, we needed to know who was threatening Israel. And, you know, at a, a point in my life, there was a day I was reading that passage, and I had to go to every single measurement and go and look for what is as tall as that. And when I, when I now finished my physical measurement of Goliath, <laughs> I'm telling you, sir, if you see Goliath in your dream, you will, <laughs> you, you will wake yourself up in the dream. <laughs> you will tell yourself, wake up, wake up. The guy, man, the guy, is, the guy was very big. He was, a massive, he was a massive, massive human being, I tell you. Massive. Look at the weight of, look at, he even describes the weight of his shield. His shield was taller than, than all normal human beings. More heavier than 10 people put together. My God. An individual had to be carrying it. Do you understand? He had somebody carrying his shield though. Somebody was carrying his shield and he was walking behind that person. Almighty Father. <laughs> if that <laughs> it, it's 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 amazing. The Bible is amazing. So if that person should appear physically to you for a fight, me, I'm telling you, I won't do man in that matter. <laughs> I tell you, I will look for the fastest way. So, all right. So, authorial comments, and again, some authors make comments about the personality themselves deliberately. For instance, you remember Judas when he was talking about the poor, right? And he said, ah, this thing, they should have sold it and give the money to the poor. Eh. And then the author, the, the, the author, the narrator now made a comment and said, it's not because he liked the poor. It's because he was the treasurer. And he was stealing from the post. You understand? So sometimes we have authorial comments to, to tell us the kind of character that we are dealing with. And then also we have um, responses from other characters. Like, eh? I have five minutes more. They don't kill me for a year. All right, so and then we have foils. Foils are like... Um, um, depictions of positive or negatives of the other. One is a negative, and then we have a positive of that person, of that personality. I, oh my God! So we have set, we have certain. I don't know. I want to do all of this in in five minutes. All right, we have settings. Now settings refer to the environment in which the narrative occur. And and brother Oluwashogo rightly commented on the fact that many times those many some people in Af in the african culture they just carry a, a biblical passage and just take a prayer point from it without looking at the context looking at the background looking at the the, the things that surround the statements or the things that they are saying for instance i used to laugh at my students when i tell them about about some like this um this, the memory of the righteous is blessed. And then you now tell your, you tell, you tell your church, the memory of the righteous is blessed. Somebody open your mouth. Your memory is blessed. Your memory is blessed. Your memory is blessed. Ah, every student here about to write exam. Yeah, bah, 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 And then you are just quoting rubbish because that passage is talking about dead people. Dead people is saying that, you know, when you remember a dead person, a person like my mother, who is, who is late now, and I remember her, and I remember how good she used to be, I'll, I'll just laugh. I'll be happy. I'm like, oh, sweet mother. That's what they call blessed memory. Hallelujah. But now, you know, you use that to pray for all your students. And 
Uh, I used to tell my students where well, God understands. <laughs> he knows you don't want to kill all your students. All right, so every story happens in a particular place. And many times, the place where the story happens can affect the meaning of the story. So, and sometimes a setting is not just a geographical location. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is metaphoric. If you hear going down to Egypt, for instance. Egypt is a depiction. It's not only a physical location. And you have some of them like that, Babylon and, and all the others. So because I, I, five minutes, I mean. <laughs> so, but the, the setting depicts where the story happened. Rev, Rev Najibade, Dr. Najibade mentioned in the morning about the story, the, 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 um, the story of Naomi and Ruth. And how that they came back during the barley harvest is a setting that is, is sets the tone for what is about to happen. They left in famine, they returned in harvest. Again, that's the setting. So it's not only, sometimes doesn't only refer to physical locations on a map, but it's, it's significant. It describes situations like going down to the east, for instance, God banished Adam and Eve to the east. The Israelites ran towards the east. If you, if you, if you look at the setting of the east, it, it's, it always has to do with moving away from God. So not only sometimes physical location, but it, it, it describes physical locations and sometimes metaphoric locations, and it describes when an event happened, where it happened. Ah. Okay, so the fourth, I'm just jumping. So the fourth is the plot. The plot is a very serious issue because when you read narratives, you also have scenes, episodes. A combination of these scenes all together represents the plot. The plot begins from an introduction, which is usually very short, appears normal, and then it continues in a conflict. Something unusual happens. A challenge is thrown. And then the plot thickens in a climax. The, the conflict becomes more serious. And then it grows down into a resolution. So, and you have to find the plot in a narrative. You have to find the plot. Because sometimes you can wrongly plot a story. And because you are wrongly plotting the story, you are giving it a meaning that is really not its meaning. I'll give an example. Um, Gideon. Gideon, you, 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 go, you know the, the, the story of Gideon texts God. He, he, he asks God, okay, can I, I will drop the fleas if there is water every on the fleas and then there's no water everywhere then i'll know you are the one then that happens and then he asks another question again and says okay um okay i'll put the fleas again but then there'll be no water on the fleas but there'll be water in the surrounding then one minute <laughs> okay so but but actually the, 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 the that's not the plot because you can pick that and feel that that is um, knowing God's will. He was trying to know God's will. But that's not the actual story. That's not the plot. The plot begins from where God appeared like an angel to Gideon. That's where the plot begins. Where Gideon, you know, was hiding in a wine press, and then 
Somebody goes to him and say, hey, oh, mighty man, and all of that. And then it begins. That is where the plot begins. And the plot ends where, where Gideon defeats the army. If you look at the story very well, you will see that Gideon had been testing God from the very beginning of that, of that story, where God appeared to him. He had been testing God. When God wanted him to go and destroy his, uh, his father's um, idol, he went in the night. It was part of the story. That detention of God calling Gideon and Gideon refusing, kind of trying to answer or not to answer. Oh, God has told me to continue. This oh, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God gave me five minutes. So, 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 all right. So, um, then anyway, then, then Gideon, then God now, now gets to a point. God now introduces his own test. Do you see in the story, Gideon now gathers an army and then God begins to test him and say, okay, send this number home. But because God had passed all the tests of Gideon, God had passed all the tests of Gideon, it had built confidence in Gideon to now face God's exam. So God says, okay, all this one, remove them. He gladly removes them without asking questions. And then they go to battle and they win. And that plot ends. So you, you may be confused and you pick a scene in the entire plot. But if you are not careful, because your, your plotting is not correct, your meaning will be distorted. So you have to get the beginning of the story where the introduction begins, where the conflict enters, where the climax comes, where the conflict thickens, and then where the resolution, which is the, the solution to the problem comes. Because this, this man, I'll just, all right, so basically, there's also, there are also design patterns in the Bible. Every story has a pattern, and every story has a pattern that is similar to another story. And you, 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 because I don't have time, but for instance, you can look at the, 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 the pattern of the complex, tragic uh, human condition. Adam and Eve were created. God tells them there's a fruit in the, in the midst of the garden. Don't eat it. They see. They are convinced by the devil. She likes. She takes. She eats. She gets into trouble. Abraham and Sarah. Abraham was looking for a child. They see the maidservant. They take. He takes. He gets into trouble. David and Bathsheba. He sees. He likes. He takes. He gets into trouble. And you can go on and on and on and on. Um, this guy, this guy that went to collect gold, what's that his name? Achan, they go to battle. He sees gold. He likes. He takes. He gets into trouble. And you can go and on. And, and so there are stories that have that pattern all in scripture. Gehazi, thank you for mentioning. Gehazi too. He sees. He likes. He takes. He gets into trouble. So, I mean, you can, can continue to do the he sees, he takes, he likes. He gets into trouble like that. There are, there are, there are, Patterns and every biblical narrative has a pattern. And lastly, um, every biblical story has um, a rhetorical device. Um, there are so many. I just picked three. There are so many, many, many. Some of them are quite sometimes confusing, even to me. But um, but there are so many rhetorical devices. Um, they use suspense. They use pacing. Pacing is the story of. Um, Goliath and um, David, for instance, all of a sudden we just move out of the scene of, of Goliath threatening Israel, and then we move to the house of David. That is pacing. The story is quite long, but they are doing it step by step, small, 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 small. They deviate, they come back, and all of that. And then there are repetitions. When you see repetitions in the Bible, it's for emphasis. In a story, it's, it's, it's for emphasis. So take repetitions very seriously.
Sorry. Um, so let's just do a recap. Um, biblical narratives have six features. They are one, the narrator. Thank you for answering me, Gary. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. 